Good morning or good afternoon to all participants today. We have great representation from across Canada on our webinar today. My name is Vishna zaborski Breton, and I'm the Director of Communications with the Canadian Parks and Recreation Association. I'd like to welcome everyone to the CPRA webinar on Building Enhanced Collaboration Between Recreation and Sport. This is the second webinar CPRA has hosted in 2013, and we look forward to holding a couple more webinars later this year. Stay tuned to our website, www.cpra.ca, and you can also find us on Facebook and Twitter for more information on future webinars. I'd like to introduce our presenters today, Mr. Philip Hockman and Mr. Richard Way. Philip is the member of the CPRA Board of Director Directors representing Recreation Nova Scotia. Philip has served for the last 37 years as the Director of Recreation for the Municipality of Guysborough in Nova Scotia. Richard is the project leader for the Canadian Sport for Life movement, and both gentlemen have played a significant role in the development of the CPRA and CS4L document, Building Enhanced Collaboration Between Recreation and Sport. Philip and Richard will give a 30-minute presentation on this topic, and then we'll open it up the floor to questions and answers. During the presentation, you'll be invited to participate in questions or polls, which will pop up over the presentation slides. Your responses will give the presenters some in-depth knowledge on your views and opinions on this topic. I would also like to thank the Leisure Information Network for providing us with technical support on today's webinar. Should you need any assistance, Jennifer Pelche is on the call with us today. I would now like to turn things over to Philip and Richard. Uh, thanks very much for attending. It's uh, really exciting to be able to uh, build enhanced collaboration between recreation and sport. And uh, there's been a tremendous amount of work that's gone into uh, uh, developing uh, a couple of papers that uh, really form uh, our thinking around. This discussion is rooted in uh, a couple of papers that were created over the last uh, few years. And um, the, the work that uh, has been done has been based on the fact that we see a, a disconnect between sport and recreation in North America, and it's uh, and it's unique to North America, in um, that uh, we've somehow got to a place where uh, sport is not um, considered with uh, very high regard within the recreation community uh, often. Um, and we see that as being based on uh, poor practices within sport. And so we want to use uh, LTAD, Canadian Sport for Life, to bring recreation and sport back together so that there's a, a real comfort that the sport uh, is, that's being delivered is of high quality and something that uh, recreation practitioners are, are excited about having within their community. We're doing this because we really have to address the uh, the negative trends that are happening uh, within um, our world, uh, where we have so many um, overweight children uh, in the world and uh, and an increasing obesity problem, which uh, is is uh, leading to um, detrimental uh, health and wellness uh, and uh, and really um, productivity of people. So we wanted to. Um, not be uh, insane, as it were, as Albert Einstein's famous quote, doing the same thing over and over again and expecting different results. So uh, as we move forward, uh, the, um, we're, we look at it through the lens of the Canadian Sport for Life uh, model. And that model is different than the athlete development models that were created in the 60s and 70s, where uh, there was uh, uh, those models were created where there was a, a whole bunch of uh, people in um, in community sport, uh, and uh, you systematically got rid of them until there was uh, a, a pinnacle uh, on top of a, a triangle that was uh, Olympic champions. We see sport uh, from a different perspective in terms of we want to have all children. Um, uh, physically literate and so when uh, they start from uh, zero to six uh, that they be have an active start and then move from there to learn their fundamentals and then learn to learn to be active learn to train and play from there 
we'll see where uh, children go off into uh, an excellent stream and, and maybe one day represent uh, the country with uh, that good base of physical literacy. Others will enjoy being active and, and competitive, and, and others will simply be fit for life. And, uh, but all of those things uh, within the Canadian Sport for Life model um, are honored. Um, if, you're, if you're a participant, uh, it's great. And so with this new lens, um, we see that as a foundation, a framework uh, to allow uh, a better collaboration going forward with uh, sport and recreation. Having uh, an extensive uh, municipal uh, recreation background, uh, it's uh, quite apparent that uh, municipalities and through municipalities, communities have a major uh, role in the implementation uh, and the delivery of sport within a municipality and or a community. And uh, that role can be seen in uh, several perspectives. Uh, one, uh, municipalities are the largest uh, own is, uh, you know, from a capital perspective of uh, sport facilities in this country. So whether it's a, uh, an arena, a uh, swimming pool, indoor or outdoor, soccer fields, ball fields, uh, you know, uh, curling clubs, et cetera, et cetera, that uh, the, the provision and the ownership of facilities directly related to sport, uh, that's a huge role for uh, municipal departments and hence municipalities. In addition, uh, municipalities across the country uh, play a significant role in the provision of sport, either directly or indirectly. Uh, having said that, uh, I know several departments uh, may be uh, actually doing direct provision of sport programming in their respective municipalities, or several municipalities might be supporting uh, nonprofit organizations in their delivery of uh, sports within their uh, municipalities and communities. Again, uh, the main point is that municipalities play a large role in the provision of direct or indirect services uh, in the sports system. And uh, the last uh, perspective would be that uh, even outside of sports sometimes, just having young boys and girls participating in uh, you know, uh, active and physical movements uh, that we uh, as uh, municipal recreation departments can train our staff, uh, whether it's in high five or fundamental movement skills, so that when uh, our leaders uh, are directly uh, involved and engaged with young boys and girls, they have the opportunity to provide quality experiences and start to uh, introduce the young boys and girls in the correct movements, uh, which we'll talk about later under the whole physical literacy component. So it's quite apparent that municipalities and or communities uh, have a large role in the provision of sport uh, in, in Canada. So recognizing that uh, municipal recreation is really critical to uh, the delivery of sport in Canada and recognizing that there being uh, a bit of a, a disconnect between recreation and sport and, um, and then uh, with Canadian Sport for Life having the, the philosophy um, of, of, of collaboration and working together. Um, uh, a, a paper was written, uh, and uh, Gary Shelton, who's on the line, uh, really in, uh, was a catalyst for this uh, in, in terms of in a, in a role as a, as a city um, a sport council. Gary recognized that, uh, that this was critically important uh, to move forward to, uh, to create a, a better connection. So he did a whole bunch of work and, and, and laid the groundwork of a paper that then was followed on by uh, Paul Gerbala um, out of Ontario. Um, uh, myself, I did a little little contribution to it, as well as uh, Mark Vlami, who worked uh, in the uh, Vancouver Park Board in, Van in, uh, uh, in recreation. So we created a paper uh, to really initiate a dialogue with, with the recreation community. And, uh, and that, was, um, that was successful because it, it led uh, to a couple of things. Um, one, uh, a paper by uh, C, uh, CPRA, which uh, Flip will talk about in, in uh, a few minutes, but it also um, identified a bit of a foundation so that when uh, the, the dialogue started to happen around Canadian Sport Policy 2.0, um, it, it really, uh, the involvement uh, of 
municipal recreation in a sport policy uh, cannot be denied. And certainly, um, it, it, it's been an interesting uh, uh, five or six years in terms of working with the federal government um, and their view around uh, including in policy documents uh, the word municipal um, and community uh, because of the structure of the way the federal government works and their uh, and their were uh, within the governance of Canada their structure to relate only to provinces and provinces uh, very um, guarded um, perspective around uh, their municipal jurisdictions and so it was a, a big achievement to see uh, a much more um, much more of a recognition in the Canadian Sport Policy 2.0 of the uh, of the community, uh, which I, I think has really um, set a platform uh, for uh, for us to move forward in a in a much more um, uh, kind of sophisticated and comprehensive way of uh, of of sport in Canada, working um, from e essentially the national uh, to the community level. So, which uh, leads us to the uh, paper that uh, has been just actually circulated in January 2013. Uh, as Richard indicated, uh, the first uh, paper was done uh, by CSRL, and uh, at the conference, CSRL conference that took place in Ottawa in 2011, CPRA had sent me as a representative because of my background in sport and municipal recreation to attend the pre-conference workshop and the conference. Uh, at that uh, time, I became aware of the uh, building uh, collaboration paper that CSRL had done, and uh, while it was an outstanding document, uh, there, uh, first of all, it was somewhat lengthy in nature, and I guess the one thing I've learned from my own experience is that when we have extremely lengthy documents, sometimes everybody doesn't read them, and also we thought that the paper needed to have some changes. As a result, uh, we took uh, that original document that Richard uh, already has indicated that we brought it back to the CPRA board and uh, the board felt that uh, maybe a uh, major uh, revision was uh, in the best interest of all parties. Uh, CSRL had agreed uh, to let us do that and as a result uh, CPRA then uh, hired uh, Don Hunter, uh, former past president and probably one of the most recognized municipal recreation people in Canada to uh, reformulate and reauthor uh, a paper which is building enhanced collaboration between recreation and sport. Uh, Don uh, took a few uh, months to write the paper, and then uh, in the BCRPA conference in May of 2011, uh, at that uh, conference we also had some national delegates, and uh, we had about a two, three-hour session where Don actually took uh, the original draft that he had done, and we sort of workshopped uh, the paper, uh, what delegates liked, what uh, they thought they needed to prove, what changes had to be done. And as a result of that uh, workshop, uh, Don made some um, more revisions. Uh, and then at the National Recreation Summit, which took place in October 2011 in Lake Louise, uh, Don did a, about a 20-minute uh, overview uh, a presentation on the paper, which was received uh, by and large uh, in a tremendous acclaim by all the delegates uh, in Lake Louise. Subsequent to that, uh, we made some more changes again. Uh, and it came back to the board, and the board, the CPRA board, approved uh, in principle the document in the spring of uh, 2012, as well as the document that Donna did was now workshopped at the uh, CS Rail Conference in Gatineau in January of 2012. So we had more feedback now from delegates uh, uh, nationally and from just people wanting to give us feedback. Uh, as a result, uh, also because of the Canadian Sport Policy, which we're going to, uh, which Richard started to talk about. And as we know, it just got approved this past summer, uh, 2012. We had to make some changes to the paper now that the uh, sport policy was done and approved by the federal government, as well as some uh, aspects about uh, the whole federal uh, national infrastructure deficit regarding sport. So finally, in the fall of 2012, the CPRA board uh, approved the document. Uh, CSRL approved the document. Uh, we had to make, again, some design changes, and I'd like to thank CSRL for being responsible for all the design work and uh, all the excellent uh, final pictures that uh, was done. And as a result, both parties signed off, and the official document, which you now see on the screen, was actually uh, released 
uh, at the CS Rail Conference in 2013 uh, and released nationally. We had a joint uh, press release. And uh, I know when I made uh, individual presentations to the Minister of Sport and the Undersecretary of the Minister of Health, we hand, uh, hand gave them these documents. And uh, to date, the feedback has been tremendous. And I think it's a, a major uh, turning point for both fields that they were following on the same page, working together to create, obviously, a better society for all Canadians in this country. Which uh, leads us to the foundation of the emerging partnerships. So within the uh, perspective of the implementation of uh, some of the uh, recommendations in the document, it's quite apparent that uh, partnership principles and collaboration principles are uh, really required in order to move the agenda forward, uh, not only nationally, provincially, but ultimately municipally, and at the end of the day, uh, in the different communities right across the uh, country. So as a result, uh, the sport and recreation sectors are working together, but it's quite apparent that, first of all, school sport uh, is a major player in the uh, implementation of sport programs. Coming from a uh, rural community the last uh, three decades, uh, you know, it's uh, really a major uh, influence here in rural uh, Canada, where sometimes uh, club sports don't exist, and school sports are the only uh, opportunity for boys and girls to take part in organized sporting activities. So obviously, uh, Department of Education and local school boards and local schools need to be involved, uh, creating really a tri-partnership with recreation, sport, and education. Uh, to expand on this uh, diagram, uh, Richard, you want to uh, add some comments? Um, no, I think it's pretty self-explanatory. We can just, you're on a roll, so keep on going. <laughs> okay, sounds good. Uh, whoops, I lost it here. I, uh, moving on, uh, as Richard talked about, the, uh, the sports system, uh, as we know, this uh, past uh, year, uh, the federal government released uh, Canadian Sport Policy 2.0, which uh, I think is another major significant uh, change in the sports system in the country. Uh, first of all, uh, within the document, the two key areas are uh, uh, indicated. The, one, the whole part about uh, physical literacy is clearly documented as a major component uh, in the program, and in addition, uh, recreation within the recreation context is identified in the sport policy. And again, uh, from my perspective, for the first time uh, that I've uh, been around, you can actually see how the uh, federal government in a national perspective understands uh, really that the community level uh, where the municipalities play a role, sport is essential as a starting point. So it was a wonderful uh, document, uh, I think. Uh, from our perspective, meaning CPRA, and the, uh, the reality was because of the advocacy of CSRL and CPRA, uh, we came up with a document that I think really uh, relates to overall the best interests of all the aspects of sport in the country. Uh, so clearly it's quite apparent that uh, the municipalities play a large role in the sport delivery system and that also physical, re physical literacy has been really uh, identified uh, as a key uh, component in sport. Uh, moving on, and I'm having a little trouble here on my screen, but uh, the next uh, area that came out uh, in the document were the six areas of enhanced collaboration between recreation and sport. Uh, in the document, it clearly indicates how, first of all, we need to increase the mutual awareness of, uh, first of all, physical literacy, of the whole CS Rail framework, because uh, there seems to be a large gap between, say, uh, some of the sport-related activities that the NSOs and the PSOs are implementing and the actual uh, implementation of sporting programs that, say, a community coach might be doing. To use uh, an example, uh, baseball has the program Rally Cap, uh, which you know uh, the NSOs and the PSOs have all accepted. But I think when I speak to most community baseball coaches, say, for example, in Nova Scotia, most of the coaches still are not implementing the program rally cap. And uh, so it's quite apparent from my perspective that there's a huge disconnect uh, between uh, what's going on at the NSO, PSO level and what's really being implemented at the community sport level. Hence the need for mutual awareness. Uh, from a municipal and community perspective as well, national and provincial perspective, about uh, 
physical literacy, the framework of CSRL, and all the changes in sport that the public and parents are not aware about. Uh, the second key point is the whole component of supporting the physical literacy program development, which is a foundation piece for all sport in Canada. Unfortunately, uh, many uh, boys and girls are active in sports, but they've never really learned the uh, eight basic fundamental movements. And uh, as a result, while they may be somewhat successful in sport, the transition hasn't been as good as we hope to see between early childhood and actually when they move into the competitive sport levels. Uh, as a result, uh, we see physical literacy uh, being uh, implemented, first of all, in every elementary school uh, in Canada. It would be great if we had certified quality teachers and that there would be sufficient time uh, from every grade that young boys and girls will be learning physical literacy programs. In addition, uh, municipal recreation departments, as I stated earlier, every one of our departments that have uh, programs dealing with young boys and girls, all our leaders should be all trained in not only high five principles, but in the principles of fundamental movement skills so that when they are actually implementing the, their programs with younger boys and girls, those uh, fundamental movement skills could be implemented to all the children, thus creating more activity, more success, more fun, and as a result, children staying in sport longer. The third component is the uh, whole idea of municipal planning and sports strategy development. Uh, I think we'll touch on this a little later, but uh, to our knowledge, there may be only three or four municipalities that have actually approved sport policy papers. And while we've done, municipalities have done some really nice things from a strategic planning perspective, uh, most of us really do not have great sport policies uh, in place. We don't have great sport planning policy programs in place. And uh, even in Nova Scotia, where we have a whole uh, bunch of new physical, uh, municipal physical staff people, uh, some of us still haven't even started implementing physical literacy programs within the municipal programs. The fourth uh, aspect is the whole uh, concept of sport councils. And again, uh, these would be, again, your nonprofit organizations in your local municipalities, uh, you know, forming a, a sport council, bringing together all these sports stakeholders so that under one umbrella, everybody could be, uh, you know, talking the same page, uh, doing the same programming, avoiding over-specialization uh, for children at early ages, avoiding 12-month uh, uh, seasons for sport. Uh, we really know from all the research that athletes that participate in multi-sport are much better off in the long term for being uh, even at a highly competitive level, and yet uh, we keep still promoting, you know, uh, 12-month sport and, you know, try not to uh, begin involved in multi-sport. So sport councils play a key role in the whole uh, aspect of collaboration between recreation and sport. Uh, the fifth concept about facility planning, again, uh, as I said earlier, municipalities own, operate, lease, and rent facilities uh, regarding sport provision. And, uh, you know, down the road, uh, just thinking long-term, you know, you could see that, uh, that if you have a sport organization using your facilities, and uh, you want to have a better collaborative approach, you know, you have these local groups, uh, make sure they enhance sport programs that fall within the Canadian Sport for Life framework, and as a result, uh, then they would have hopefully better access to your facilities, which leads us to the whole access and allocation, and that when municipalities develop facility planning and have the whole access allocation policy as part of the planning, they make sure access and allocation uh, directly correlate with organizations implementing Canadian Sport for Life framework programs and policies within the implementation of nonprofit sport organizations in their communities, which will take us on to the next slide, which is uh, the whole aspect of, uh, here we go, community of physical literacy workshops. And that brings us uh, to one of the points I think you're going to see happen. Uh, in Canada, where we're now in the process of starting to implement uh, community and or physical literacy workshops. Uh, I know in Nova Scotia, speaking specifically being from here, that uh, just last month in February, the Highland Region uh, implemented a uh, community uh, sport uh, recreation workshop uh, within the Canadian Sport for Life framework. Uh, we had 40 participants. Uh, the workshop was a huge success. It's quite apparent that a lot of uh, municipal staff and local community sports stakeholders are not yet fully uh, 
educated about uh, the framework and uh, as well as about physical literacy development principles and programs. Uh, so there's a starting point for all uh, aspects uh, find, uh, I find, especially here in the Maritimes. And as a result, these workshops, which will usually be a day in length, uh, based upon community development principles, will clearly demonstrate to any municipality and or community how they can start from where they are now and uh, openly become a Canadian Sport for Life champion, uh, thus implementing programs and policies in their respective communities that fall within the framework. Uh, the CSRL have developed, actually, which we'll get to later, a five-step process, uh, and I don't want to talk about that too much now, but again, uh, these workshops, uh, I know in Nova Scotia, uh, there's going to be uh, five more regional workshops taking place within the next year. Uh, we've been in contact with Newfoundland. I know the workshops are going to be going on there in the fall, and uh, some workshops I know have been going on in Alberta. Physical, the developing physical literacy workshops are right now being uh, formulated and planned. I know, Vicki, you're on the phone. Uh, Vicki Haber is one of the key authors of that program, and we'll be test piloting the physical literacy workshops in Alberta uh, within the next few months. And uh, the idea is that within, say, uh, six to nine months, we'll have a national standard workshop, whether it's the workshop for uh, community, uh, uh, community, you know, community development programs and or phys physical literacy workshops. So there will be two streams, both interrelated, and uh, we expect uh, and anticipate a huge demand for these workshops right across the country. So further on awareness, I just want to bring uh, your attention to um, the uh, Active for Life site. Active for Life uh, with uh, B210 is um, a partner of uh, Canadian Sport for Life, and they're, they've created a very rich um, resource that uh, is targeted at uh, parents of, uh, of zero to eight. And so, uh, again, it's, this is just simply to bring it to your attention, and, and hopefully um, you can use your networks to uh, uh, make uh, parents aware um, of this rich resource, which will, what we're, um, the, in, the intent of the uh, Active for Life uh, website is to educate parents of zero to eight so that they demand uh, quality sport. So they understand what quality sport is and that they, uh, that they then um, uh, seek it out uh, to, uh, to give us an opportunity to improve, um, improve sport. Um, on uh, further, uh, there's um, the Canadian Sport for Life uh, website. The Canadian Sport for Life website is um, uh, another uh, rich resource. There's tons and tons of information on there, probably a little bit too much. We have to figure out how to uh, get at that information in a, in a more uh, efficient way. Um, but here's a, an example you'll see on the right where there's the International Physical Literacy Conference that's happening in Banff. There's also fine quality sport programs. And this is uh, uh, when, when you go into that and took a, took a look around that, you'd see um, the example of Rally Cap that uh, Flip uh, gave earlier and, and uh, other programs that are, the, are programs that have been reviewed or, or advanced uh, with the expertise of the National Sport Organization and for uh, recreation professionals in the community uh, to ask their local clubs to say, is this the program that you're running, um, would, uh, would be a big step in terms of uh, improving the quality of, uh, uh, of programs in our community. You'll also see on the bottom right uh, Club Excellence, and I know Kyle is <laughs> on the line, and uh, what that is is a club quality standard, um, and uh, and so again, in terms of improving the quality of uh, of sport, there is now uh, a standard, a club excellence or club quality standard, a club um, you know kind of mark of excellence that has been created and is in is really in its early stages of of uh, of activity um, and development, but. Again, it's it's there and and uh, becoming uh, more advanced as we go along. And so, um, so this uh, Canadian Sport for Life website is um, 
a tre treasure trove of, of, uh, of resources and information. So then um, continuing along, and I just want to uh, give a quick peek into some of the uh, things that we've got um, underway right now uh, in, uh, around physical literacy. We're, uh, we've been working closely with um, a number of people that, uh, led by uh, Dr. Dean Creelars at the University of Manitoba to create a physical literacy assessment for youth. And uh, th those, uh, these resources will be targeted as a parent, the coach, as well as, as uh, really anybody that's working with kids. It's going to be complemented by um, PHE Canada uh, has created a Passport for Life, which is a physical literacy assessment that's going to be targeted at teachers in the schools. And these really will be targeted at everybody else that works, uh, works with children. And uh, these are going to be launched in, in Banff, and so you can kind of look out for, for those uh, coming in, uh, in about a month from now. And, um, and those resources are aimed at, at being able to, again, start to educate uh, parents around um, that children need to develop a basic movement vocabulary to become physically literate. And are they engaging in the programs that are allowing that uh, the development of that movement vocabulary? And uh, so, uh, very similar to literacy, um, you know, we know that uh, most parents would have a really good understanding of of where their child's reading level is, um, or whether they're they're understanding math at an appropriate level. Um, what these tools will will help us. Uh, uh, understand is that uh, there is actual skill uh, in movement that will, uh, if we do it correctly and we have an underlying uh, strong uh, movement abilities in our children, they're uh, more likely to be active for life. Uh, Complementing uh, those, um, uh, the play resources uh, are the uh, developing physical literacy warm-ups. And, uh, and again, as you can see on the screen, there's uh, three sets of warm-ups targeted at, uh, at uh, different ages that we will be encouraging. And again, these are going to be launched in, in Banff at the uh, end of April. Um, and we'll be encouraging uh, uh, sports and uh, uh, recreation programs and uh, phys ed programs to use uh, these uh, warm-ups um, so instead of just uh, doing a, a simple warm-up, uh, this warm-up will, uh, will contribute to the development of physical literacy. So those are on their way. Um, so, for, uh, so that's around the physical literacy, um, uh, physical literacy component in terms of municipal sports strategies. Uh, this is... Um, uh, there's three examples uh, before you, and, and uh, we're uh, really encouraging communities to look at, um, uh, at developing sports strategies. Uh, uh, those that are online uh, from the recreation communities would, you know, would uh, be very familiar with recreation master plans and, uh, and the like. Um, those have often been... Um, facility-based and, and uh, with the driver of being uh, uh, around capital planning. Um, and uh, so uh, it's to look at what, what is the quality of sport uh, in the community, how, are, uh, how is sport contributing to that overall wellness of a community through the development of um, physical literacy and, and uh, excellence and active for life. So. Uh, again, this is just a, a bit of an awareness. Then um, moving on, I'll, I'll flip it back to Flip uh, to, uh, to talk a little bit about the uh, becoming a Canadian Sport for Life community. So uh, as I uh, indicated earlier, there is a process now underway, which is uh, a workshop uh, that would allow any uh, community or any municipality to uh, first of all go through the process and start 
uh, on the road of how any uh, municipality community could hopefully become a Canadian Sport for Life champion. Uh, the, the targeted goal uh, for CFRL and CPRA is to have 100,000 uh, champions across the country. And uh, as I said earlier, we just did a workshop here in a regional workshop in Nova Scotia. As a result, we had 40 new champions now, uh, you know, bought in and uh, in the implementation stages of how to become a champion, which we'll show in the next slide. Uh, this uh, document, uh, the activation plan that you see right in front of you, was released in uh, January of 2013 in Gatineau. And, in fact, we used the uh, framework within that own document uh, in the workshop that we just hosted. Uh, within the document, uh, and again, hopefully you'll go on to it later on, there is a, a self-evaluation stage for any municipality and community to see, you know, where you would be now uh, in, in relative terms to uh, becoming a CS Frail champion. Now, obviously, because we're, you know, early uh, in the whole process, we would not expect most communities to self-assess uh, at a very, very high score. Having said that, I think uh, that the fact that most communities and or municipalities could identify uh, huge gaps and areas of where they can improve, uh, the uh, document is really a great uh, guideline and uh, shows ways of how uh, different uh, communities can move along the target goals to become a CS Rail champion. Again, uh, everything really relates back to uh, community development principles. So while you yourself may be a super dedicated, uh, passionate person about this whole uh, concept and framework, the reality is to create major change in the community, you need collaborative partners. You need to go through a process to get the partners on board through education. You need a, a good uh, plan to get them committed for action. And at the end of the day, it's just really implementing basic community development principles uh, so that everybody in the community is on the same page, which will really give you much better results than one individual who's dedicated to trying to do everything by themselves. So again, uh, we are really uh, hopeful and encouraged that we would anticipate many, many of these workshops being held across the country in every respective province in the next uh, uh, coming year or years. And again, that this uh, document, Becoming a Canadian Sport for Life Community, will be a main piece of any municipal recreation delivery system in any community in the country. Uh, as a result, uh, the uh, next uh, long-term community development factors, uh, we just actually developed uh, these uh, last Friday. We had a lot of uh, factors, but we put them in a very succinct form. So these will be the factors for becoming a community CS Rail uh, champion. Obviously, collaboration in your community is a uh, key component. Uh, having some policies and then some strategic priorities to implement uh, would be a uh, huge uh, help. Uh, leadership, uh, starting with yourself and other key uh, sectoral partners in your community and engaging even those people that may uh, be involved in the sport but may, may not be as aware of some of the information as you are would be a, a major uh, component. Knowledge transfer, which is obviously the whole aspect of educating uh, like partners and uh, people uh, that uh, parents, uh, administrators, anybody and everybody involved in sport. And then training leaders uh, to get involved. And one of the things that uh, we're going to do is we're going to probably train different facilitators to do the workshops across the country. Obviously, quality sport uh, has to be implemented at all levels and all stages. Uh, and as I said earlier, you know, all sports have modified games uh, for, you know, for beginning children in early stages of CSRL, and yet most local coaches are still probably not implementing uh, the new concepts but are doing something that they've been doing for 20 years uh, because they just maybe not be aware of these changes. The whole huge physical literacy component, which I think is a uh, foundation piece that can almost stand alone by itself. And Richard uh, has uh, indicated some great resource materials that are going to be unveiled at the uh, conference in Banff uh, next month. The whole concept of facilities, which we talked about early, earlier, planning, access, and allocation coming within that framework. And then at the end of the day, the whole sport for development, uh, not just for competitive sport, but for sport for uh, socialization processes, mental health processes, and obviously uh, because of the inactivity, obesity issue in Canada, the whole uh, aspect of sport creating a uh, physically healthy and active uh, lifestyle for all Canadians. Which leads us to now uh, this uh, document, which will actually uh, clearly indicate 
what are the uh, five long-term steps to becoming a CSRL champion. So the first step, uh, which is, I guess, everybody uh, on the webinar today, everybody would be examining, you know, where maybe, you know, you are, what do you want to do, but you actually haven't set on a course of action. So just, you know, getting involved, becoming aware, and having, you know, wanting to do something within this whole context. Uh, the second stage, which is exploring, you, you know, you have identified that in your community you know changes have to be made, but right now you don't have a detailed strategic plan that will be resourced that will allow this change to uh, occur. The third stage will be a mobilization plan where you now you actually have the plan. It's a resource, whether it's human, financial, who's going to do what, by when, and where, and you've a uh, gun to advance the plan, but obviously, like every other plan, you know, it takes time to finally um, implement it uh, to get everything done. Leads us on to the uh, next stage in ascending order, the whole concept of executing change, where now you have a cross-sectoral initiative, as we discussed earlier. You have strong resources, whether it's human, financial, or volunteers, and you've now actually begun making real significant inroad changes in your community, which leads us to the stage of being a champion, where our community has made strong progress. We continue to reevaluate, as we always should, and strategically figure out how we can improve, where there are gaps, and what you now utilize as a positive example and share with everybody else in the country of all your tremendous success stories regarding this uh, framework and implementation stage. So those are the five long-term uh, steps on becoming a Canadian Sport for Life champion which takes us uh, to the last uh, slide. Richard? So, um, I, again, uh, thanks very much for, uh, for being on the call. I, um, I think, um, as you can see in, you know, kind of in summation, is that there's been a, a lot of work done to get to this point, but really it's, uh, it's just the beginning. So we've, uh, yeah, basically worked to get to the start line. And, and what... Um, What's been so uh, exciting and powerful in this has been the, kind of the, the collective energy. And, uh, and so uh, as an example, with the becoming a, a CS for All community document, uh, the, the, the principal writers are, are on the line of Gary Shelton and, and Vicki Harbour and the energy that they put in to then uh, make that available for the rest of the country. Um, is uh, is an example of how if we collectively work together, um, we're, we're, we we can do great things. And then uh, and then if we you know also celebrate best practices. Uh, so as an example, I know Leftbridge is on uh, on the call, and Leftbridge does a Canadian Sport for Life week, culminating in Sports Day in Canada. And and I mean it's just a great example of uh, stimulating and exciting. A community to be uh, to be active for life. So um, I think if we uh, if we can uh, work together, collaborate, uh, share, and then uh, uh, and then celebrate those best practices, um, you know, we'll be able to advance uh, very quickly from this starting point that we're at now. Uh, so thanks very much, and and then I think I'm turning it over to Vishnu to to moderate questions now. Sure. Thank you, Richard and Philip, um, very much. And uh, we'd like to open up the floor uh, for questions. So feel free to raise your hand or uh, type a question into the chat box. Um, and we can go from there. Questions? And Jennifer is just letting everyone know if you want to press um, star six to unmute your, your line, you can do that. I think Marilyn's got something for us. Marilyn, feel free to just uh, join into the conversation if you'd like. quiet bunch. <laughs> Anybody have any questions at all? And as well as if, um, if Gary or Vicki or, uh, or uh, Kyle want to further explain um, what, uh, what they're doing, they're, they're welcome to as well. Okay, I'm not sure go. that I, I 
got everything right in, in uh, my explanation, so you're, you're welcome to check in as well. Is there a fee to be a member of Sport for Life? Uh, Richard, you want to answer that one? Um, yes, I'll answer that. There, there is no fee. Um, essentially, uh, Sport for Life is a, is a movement. And so uh, philosophically, we've operated in a very open source uh, approach. So uh, we, uh, you know, we put all our resources um, online uh, uh, for, uh, for download. Um, I, I do think that uh, with some of the upcoming resources that, uh, you know, we'll be, we'll be making them available online, but we'll probably package them up and also make them available um, at a cost. But there is no, uh, it is, it's not uh, your, your traditional organization where there's a, a membership fee uh, to be part of it. it it's, uh, it's more of a, a movement. Uh, we have a question from Abigail about uh, the community of physical literacy workshops. Will it be targeted for the public or mainly available for community recreation professionals? Um, uh, yeah. You want to answer that, Richard, or you want me to jump in on that one? Yeah, I'll, I'll jump in on that in terms of <clears throat> what um, I think it would be more targeted at um, uh, uh, not at the public per se, but uh, it would be community recreation professionals. It might also be uh, uh, health professionals, or it uh, might be people that are, are uh, working in the area of sport, so sport coaches sport administrators, um, so not, uh, uh, not, not the general public, but rather uh, people who are, are in situations where they're working with, um, working with the public and working with children. Okay, we have a question from Suzanne. Suzanne, I asked from D.C. Hi, Suzanne. Are we aware of any recreational park PT organizations that have developed a provincial plan to promote CS for within their province? Uh, I'm not aware of that as of yet. Does anybody online know of any uh, uh, provincial PT recreational organizations that have uh, promoting CS for L within their plan? I know Ontario will be doing so in their next uh, planning process, but they haven't done it yet, and I don't want to speak for Ontario for sure. Yeah, um, and um, uh, Vicky may Vicky or Gary might want to jump in on this, but uh, in terms of um, Alberta, um, we're working uh, with uh, ARPA as well as Alberta BFIT for Life um, on a plan to uh, to basically um, advance Canadian Sport for Life in uh, in all the regions um, of Alberta, and so it's um, uh, it's kind of a, a bit of a new partnership that's uh, just getting underway um, where. Uh, Leah Norris is the, uh, the the focal person, where where actually uh, she is being contracted to lead the implementation of uh, of CSRL into communities by by three parties. And I know Suzanne said they might be the first. But I know BC and definitely Alberta are probably two of the uh, more progressive events uh, leaders from a PT recreation association uh, regarding CSRL framework in the country. Uh, we have a we had a question from how do we get Katie Barrett Kate Barrett how do we get copies of the community plans? Well, I guess uh, while we're really encouraging everybody once they have a community plan to make sure they uh, share them with CSRL uh, so that all the different community plans success stories can be shared right across the country with everybody. So uh, you know it's a really a two way uh, conduit communication that you know we all, we also want to out the. You know, provide resources to everybody. But again, every community municipality that has a great success story or a really good plan, please share them with us, so we can share them with uh, other communities and municipalities across the country. Uh, Vicky uh, suggested that uh, for everybody in the webinar, you might want to go to the CSRL website and use the message of training PowerPoint presentations, which I know are extremely uh, high quality. Just on my stuff. We got all kinds of people typing now, which is good, eh? <laughs> yeah, they're they're on the um, uh, under the Become a Champion tab on the Canadian Sport for Life .ca website, and those those are uh, there's a a variety of uh, messenger uh, presentations. Um, 
they're very simple. Uh, the, the, the first one is, um, is 15 minutes, and it's something that can be shown as part of an AGM, uh, you know, a sport AGM or, a, or a, a recreation board meeting that identifies this is the, uh, this is the basis of Canadian Sport for Life. Um, and, uh, and then there's, uh, uh, so there's the basic one, then there's a part two, there's three different part twos. One is for physical literacy, one is for individual sport, and one is for team sport. And I know in the uh, workshop that we hosted here in the region, we used some of those, and they were just tremendous resources and really powerful messages. Okay, we have a, uh, from Linda Whitfield, the first document, uh, Richard showing partner, recreation with sports, is that one of the first papers out? And have we moved on from there? from the first paper that you talked about? Um, the, uh, yeah, the answer is um, uh, yes, in terms of the, the, um, uh, the CPRA becoming a um, uh, building enhanced collaboration between recreation and sport. Um, I do think that, uh, as, uh, as Flip said, the first paper was um, uh, very lengthy. Um, it was it was uh, it was written really with uh, four parts to it, and the fourth part being being very detailed in terms of uh, um, kind of a stage by stage uh, uh, to do list. Um, so uh, uh, so you know if you have a bit of time to to read, uh, there's still uh, I I uh, I'm of the opinion that there's there's great content in that uh, in that first paper as well. Okay, we have a question from Abigail. In my experience in the UK, they have a team of sport development officers in the municipal recreation setting to help implement the sport and LTADs and create pathways. Do you foresee Canada moving to this type of structure? You want to jump on that one, Richard? Um, yeah, the 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 UK um, are a little bit uh, a little bit different in terms of their uh, uh, their investment. Um, into sport at the community level. Um, I think this is where, uh, if we uh, um, if we look at what's happened in Vancouver in terms of of uh, through the process of writing the sports strategy, um, uh, the Vancouver Parks Board moved from a position where uh, if a sport organization came to the Vancouver Park Board, they would say, uh, "No, you're you're in the wrong place. Maybe go talk to Sport BC, somebody else." Um, uh, to to now where they have people employed uh, at the Vancouver Parks Board that are uh, that work as sports specialists and we we see that emerging. Um, Hamilton is a is another example where we see the city of Hamilton has has now hired sports specialists who are are implementing um, uh, LTAD in into their uh, community sport. So um, I I guess. Uh, uh, I I do see it happening, but it will be in in our Canadian structure, where uh, it will be the uh, the municipal governments that will redefine job descriptions or or create uh, new positions that will be those sport development officers, um, as opposed to uh, an. I guess a nationally funded. Right. Uh, I know in Nova Scotia, uh, as part of the bilateral agreements, uh, they've hired six regional sport consultants, and within their mandates, uh, implementation of the framework and physical literacy are some of their strategic uh, job uh, priorities. So, uh, you know, again, some enhanced human resources here in Nova Scotia. As well in Nova Scotia, most municipalities have what's called a physical activity coordinator, which is course shared by the province, and I think uh, they all have to have and develop five-year uh, strategic plans, and I'm, I'm pretty sure that you're going to see the next wave of five-year plans in Nova Scotia. Physical literacy would have to be a, an essential foundation piece of these new uh, revised physical activity plans. So uh, I think in Nova Scotia you're going to see some definite changes uh, within this whole uh, concept. Uh, Gary, I know Gary uh, has got uh, some great stuff going. Uh, uh, Edmonton, as you can see, has got a whole new uh, initiative called Play going on. And uh, I, we encourage everybody to go to the website that he put down, www.edmontonsport.com. And uh, I think you're going to see some tremendous things uh, coming out of Edmonton and probably be the fourth municipality to have a uh, long-range uh, sport policy. 
And uh, we have uh, from Laurie that uh, they've also formed a play group in Lethbridge. So, again, you can see Alberta making some significant uh, uh, additional positive changes uh, regarding implementation strategies and uh, programs. And, and Flip, uh, uh, Gary is going to have to be the fifth because uh, it's my understanding that Laurie and Lethbridge um, has, a, has a sport policy that uh, we're not aware of. But I'm sure she's going to uh, download it. Send, send us a copy. Definitely, for sure. Thank you, Laurie. And I, we apologize for that uh, oversight. Okay, she's sending it now, dynamite. And we have some more questions coming in. Hello? Okay. Oh, I think we're starting to lose some people. Okay. Multiple attendees are typing. <laughs> Everyone's typing. typing furiously. Okay. Vicki, our Edmonton School Board has adopted the term physical literacy into their curriculum. Tremendous. Schools come obviously powerful partners, without a doubt. Uh, and I think one of the things, talking about CPRA, I'm chairing the CPRA Sport Working Committee. Uh, you know, we, we, we sent, uh, we're going to send, each PT partner is going to send a generalized letter, but I think uh, you're going to see from CPRA a more detailed process how we are going to try from the recreational sector to uh, advocate to a respective education departments how physical literacy needs to become a uh, almost a core uh, piece of their elementary school curriculum. Uh, you know, not only with qualified teachers, but providing sufficient time to implement physical literacy programs in every elementary school in the country. Okay. Abigail um, sent us a thank you. Thank you, Abigail. <laughs> Perhaps we'll let uh, Sport Calgary um, be one of our last questions here as we're sure. running out of time, I think. If, uh... <laughs> so Sport Calgary is updating their Civic Sport Power Band, which is great, dynamite. Perfect. It's good to see. And again, you know, while we see this being done by obviously the uh, larger municipal units, some of the cities, it doesn't really preclude any municipality, small, medium, or rural, that uh, they could not come up with a, you know, a sport policy based upon the realities of their situation. So just because it's been cities to date, again, you know, it's wide open for every municipality. I guess that may be it. Great. Oh, well, I guess, uh, Richard, on behalf of CPRA, I'd just like to thank all the uh, participants for taking the time and, uh, you know, listening to what we had to say. So thank you all. and. Look forward to uh, some of the resources coming out, as well as the workshops that will be coming right across the country. And I wish everybody a great Easter weekend. Thank you. Thank you to Flip and Richard and uh, everyone for their time today. Um, I think this has been a really great uh, webinar, and, and we'll look forward to continuing the dialogue uh, across the country. So thank you again for everyone for their participation and their time today. Okay. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you.